Hello, today is April 6, 2019. I'm meeting today with Mr. Lucas Hecker at his son's home in Loveland, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Luke, and thank you for uh, sitting down today to, to tell your story. Thank you. Let's start out, if we could, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Good. I'm Luke Hecker. I grew up in a farm in western Kansas. There were nine children in our family, seven boys and two girls. And I was 18 years at the age of that time. In 1943, of course, I turned 18, and uh, my parents during that time retired to move to Denver, Colorado. What, what was their profession? Farmers. Farmers. Yeah, we yeah. were farmers. Well, before yeah. we get too far ahead of your story, I'd really like to ask you a little bit about your time in Kansas. And, okay. And, uh, so you grew up on the farm there? And yeah, there were nine of us. Yeah. And seven boys and the girls and farm cattle. How, how was that? Uh, uh, can you talk a little bit about two things I like to ask your generation? What was it like going through the Great Depression? And two, what were the Dirty Thirties like? They were dirty. <laughs> yeah, they were, uh, they were bad. I think, though, Brett, during the 30s, we learned to be, what's the word? Frugal. 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 Very frugal. And if you were a farmer, it was a gamble because there was such a period of dead storms, dry, and some couldn't survive. They just left the farm and come west. And those that stayed just bear it with it and come out of it. How, how do you think you guys made it through that, that time period? It was tough. Yeah. And the only income you had is, if you had some is milk, cows, uh, cream, your milk and eggs, take them in and, and bring flour and just some staples home. You had all the meat you needed all the time as far as that's concerned. But yes, the, the dirty 30s were, until 1940, it started changing. Wow. wow. And right before uh, Pearl Harbor Day, uh, it got better, but then we stayed, we're right in the threshold of war then. Yeah. Then the things went another direction again. Right. Now, had your folks, uh, what, what year did your folks move to Denver then? 1943. 1943, yeah. 1943, yeah. yeah. And, and when they left, and I, and I did a lot, went with them, Two boys had already come back and took over farming. I lost my farm deferment. Oh, right. So yeah. the next thing I got a letter in the mail and said, Luke, report to your local recruiting station. And I just got up and I went. But I was in Denver then. Yeah. And I had choices. You want to hear them? Please. The choices were down on the street in Denver. And there were a number of us went down. They had the same notice. And there was Army, Navy, Marines, Maritime Merchant Marine. I tried to get into the Air Force, U.S. or the Navy Air Force. Stopped in there. I'd always appealed to me. And they, as soon as they signed you up, they moved you over because they needed men so bad. They gave you just a minute or a minor physical, you know, whether you could hear or whether you could see and that type of thing. And when they checked my eyes, they said, Hecker, you're not going to fly. <laughs> <laughs> so three of us walked out and said, we can't make this. Others made it. I mean, to take the next step. Uh -huh. Walked down the street and I uh, saw Maritime Naval Service. I said, guys, let's stop in here. I'd like to check on this. So we did. And a few of us went in there and it, they, they were different. They were almost down to the same. We need men so bad if you can see lightning and hear thunder. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take it. So I made it. Well, and that, that begs the question here. I mean, here's a, a dry land farmer from Kansas going to sea. Did that, uh, was that appealing to you or scary? Or what, uh, no, it did appeal to me yeah. to see. Um, it sounded good, I think. Yeah. I didn't know what I was getting into. Yeah. <laughs> and it sounded good. I didn't want the army for sure. I yeah. had two brothers that come back and said, Luke, don't go in the army. I mean, pick anything but 
the, the army, you know, the base army. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So I was considering what to do. I'd like to have gotten in the Navy Air Corps, but I could have went straight Navy. But I thought, well, I know more about Navy. I've heard about that from guys. But I didn't know enough about maritime merchant marine. And I just heard that they have a good training set up, and the Coast Guard has taken them over, working with the Navy, and that the rest is history. I was on my way. How much longer after you enlisted then did you, uh, did, before you shipped off? A week. A one week? In a week's time, they filled a train full of troops. They were not only merchant mariners, they were Marines in the Navy. The Marines, merchant marine and Navy filled several car loads of train on the car, on the train. We traveled two days and two nights to L.A. And in L.A. there was a bunch of buses lined up and they took the Navy to Treasure Island, you know, at San Francisco. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They kept the Marines and took them down to San Diego and they loaded us on the bus and took us over to the docks and they said, you guys are going to Catalina Island. Oh, wow. So they pointed that way and you could see it out there. About 20 miles. <laughs> so they put us on a ship called the Avalon and it's a training ship. Got to Catalina Island got off and marched, us, and get, marched right there. Get together, stand still and tell, do what I tell you. Marched us right up to a villa, took us in and they said you get about a 15 minute break and we're gonna start issuing clothes. How, how was that transition going from civilian life into military life? Was it much of a transition for you? That, uh... Well, you followed the crowd. Yeah. yeah. You followed the crowd. It was, for an 18-year-old, yes, yeah. if I'd have just been by myself, it'd been tough. But yeah. you're with other troops. They were all, we were all the same age, young. Yeah. yeah. We had everything in common. All we had to listen is to the leader and do what he told us to do. Yeah. Wow. And we did. And, and how was it for you as far as, did you have any homesickness, anything like that? I mean, probably the first time you'd ever been away from yeah, home, I would. I didn't develop that for a while. Right now, I was trying to hang on. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to hang on to the changes in the new world. Because Brett, up to that time, 18 years old, I wasn't only 50 miles from the farm. That's right, that's right, yeah. Just around that area. Yeah, and, so, and just the experience now, you're uh, on the West Coast, which had to be brand new, out on an island, of, of all things. It, it, it just had to be kind of somewhat mind-boggling, I would was. think. It yeah. was, it yeah. was. It was an eye-opener. Yeah. It really was, Brad. Yeah. But on that island, there was also Navy on the north end, but the Advanced Navy. The Advanced Navy and gunnery, and that, that they weren't any on our ship. So they kept the two of us apart. We were in the southern part. And if you've ever been to San Catalina, that, that was a, a big summer resort there. And we, uh, weekly, that uh, weekly to make that gum, uh, uh, he had a home up on the hill. And that was all donated over to the maritime service eventually. Wow. But any time, Brad, when I was there, there were always 3,000 trainees from the beginning to the end. Some were 90 days. I was six months because of my deck training and et cetera. And in six months, if I go on from there, yeah. they shipped us over to San Francisco, and we were up on Van Ness Street. They kept us there and the ships were loading. And all they had at that time, Brad, uh, I'd almost have to refer back oh, to Oh, please here. do, yes. Hey, hey, Dad, I hear uh, doing that. Uh, every time you do this. The War Administration Board requisitioned all ships available to be put into immediate service. And the maritime personnel were called up, and we were in that call about that time and had training. And Brad, while we were there, they were still lining up ships in the docks and loading them, and they couldn't get enough personnel on them to get them out of there. And this young, the only advanced on my first ship was on a troop transport with the officers. But other than that, we were young trainees and hauling 5,000 troops. Do you feel like you're, uh, you know, they were moving people so fast. Do you feel like you had proper training or was it uh, kind of training on uh, on the job, sort of? Well, 
I have an answer for that. Uh, um, we were given just enough training to go to sea and if attacked it, to survive. Wow. Whoa. Wow. That's it. Wow. And I think Carla would acknowledge that and so would Thomas yeah. and Virgil. That's the training you got. Wow. And some of that was rough training, but we made it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've got detail on that. It's rather interesting. But <laughs> Please uh, expand on it if you like. So. Oh, okay. Catalina Island was a busy place. Each month there were 3,000 recruits stationed there and were in various phases of training, which I told you. Mm -hmm. Training consists of learning basic navigation skills, how to use the 20 millimeter guns, that's were mostly on the ships. They did have five, but the advanced Navy personnel at Gunnery would take over on that. In the maritime sh marine ships, survival cases or skills in case abandoning ship was necessary. The use of lifeboats and the skills necessary to survive at sea for extended periods of time. How to obtain a sinking ship or how to abandon a sinking ship when there was fire in the ocean and use of your dungarees as a life vest. Now you had to sleep with your weapon, you had to sleep with your life jacket, but Brad, when you got attacked at a lot of times you didn't have it handy. You had to jump off 30 feet the most into the water and if you didn't have nothing with you, you hope to get a life ring mm -hmm. throat mm -hmm. or hang, uh, the lifeboats were dropped wild into the water and if they didn't get to it, I'd tell you here what happened. The use of your dungarees were then used for life shaving. You probably have familiar with mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. This was done by tying knots. You take, you had to take your pants off, first kick your shoes off in the water, take your pants off and stay, and you know in the seawater, by the way, your body is more buoyant. Mm -hmm. So you were able to keep your head above water and do that. Mm -hmm. Then you took the pants off and tied a knot into your legs. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was done by tying knots into the legs of the dungarees and then flinging it with air, you take the hair behind you and bring the jeans over, slinging them around your neck and lying across the crutch. The dungarees could hold a lot of water or air for hours they had been wet and keep a person afloat for an extended period of time. Other necessary skills learned were the use of Navy flags then. And they will not. But that answers about abandoning ship in the training you got. What, what, what's, what's going through an 18-year-old's head when, when you're getting that training? It's like, geez, what happens if I got to abandon ship? Does it, did that worry, were you scared at all? Did that scare you at all? You did, but you didn't have time to think about yeah, it much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the thing that really scared most of us is the fire. You know, there's always yeah, yeah. fuel. Yeah. Now, in Catalina Island, they took us out on the dock and I've got pictures in my book showing you mm -hmm. where they would light it up and you'd have to jump into that fire, of course. And then they taught you how to come up and make an air hole, get some breath and then go underneath Jeez. and try to swim out of there. But in the meantime, there was somebody always throwing life rings out or trying to help you. Wow. But you learn to swim. If you could only dog pedal, a lot of guys had trouble. They had guys up there watching those that got in trouble. But I, I could dog pedal and not do a little bit more than that again. Yeah, right. But when you're scared, you can do more than you think you can. Yeah. Well, I imagine up to that point, your swimming involved maybe in a, in a pond or a, a lake. Or... No, it was like the, the, the bay. Well, I'm just saying, up, uh, growing up, yeah. your, oh, yeah, your yeah, only yeah, swimming yeah. Was, at that, was that pond or Swim. maybe a big lake, but now... Uh, a, mud, a little mud. A mud <laughs> yeah, mud puddle. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, so you get up to uh, uh, Treasure Island or San Francisco Bay, and that's where you loaded your onto your first ship. Yes, San yeah. Francisco. Yeah, and and I've always heard from uh, other veterans as they as, as they left the bay and went under the the Golden Gate Bridge, the feeling they had that you know now we're going off to the uh, unknown. Absolutely, yeah. and it was every morning because you'd go out with a tide, mm -hmm. and that's the easiest way to get out because it'd be one after another ship going out with a tide. 
And when you come in, if you had to come in in the evening, you come in with the tide. Okay. Yeah. Made it easy. Because a lot of ships there, and I had to be careful. Yeah. So uh, I, I, go, I still go back to this, uh, this country boy from Landlock, Kansas. You, you go to sea. How was that for you? Did you get your sea legs, or uh, how, was, uh, how was that initial trip? It's kind of hard. Yeah. Yeah, you get seasick. Yeah. And I had to do my time on the wheelhouse. At that time, you had four hours on and four, eight hours off. And I like to get the four to eight watch when I could. But you had to put in for it when you got aboard ship. Because the officer of the day and he'd look and say, Brad, you look like it could be on 12 to 8. And the only thing you could say, now, now wait a minute, I'd like to be on 4 to 8. <laughs> well, now nah, since you're a good guy, okay. But then he'd sign, and I'd like to 4 to 8. Uh, four, 4 in the morning or uh, four, 4 in the eight afternoon? 4 in the morning, and then 4 in the 8 in the afternoon okay. uh -huh. with 8 hours off in between. Okay. Uh -huh. But off that 4 hours, you had to spend 1 hour in the front on just eye duty, one hour in fantail, watching for subs or watching for any, anything else, one hour in a wheelhouse, and that time it was a big gyro compass in the wheelhouse, and an officer of the day telling you, Hecker, 180 south. And you go, you go I'm, I'm there. And they go, no, 187, you know, and then they began to sit, they began to zigzag because of the subs. there was alarm alarm coming out. There were subs out there, and the navy was patrolling this the circumference. And I can't name me the name of the ship. Maybe uh, Carla could, but they had depth charges on mm -hmm. them, and they would drop these depth charges. And in the convoy, when we were in the convoy later on, you could actually feel the water. But it kept the subs at bay. Hmm. And that's what we had to watch at night. At night, I still, I still hear it. Wow. All windows, doors, and doors shall be closed immediately. There'll be no smoking out of the open decks, no lights, everything dark. And when you was on the watch, you always had to watch for that trail because they kept the vulnerable ships in the middle in the outer part but when the kamikazes finally attacked the convoys they would pick out the biggest ship or they they'd like to hit tankers because yeah, that right. was fires yeah and they kept uh, them and skipped the aircraft carriers out of convoys they were fast and they could but to start with bread they were in such need of ships when they got to San Francisco, the best ships they could put out on the convoy was a 10 knot. That's about 12 miles an hour. And in that, the subs, the Jap subs had no problem following. And as soon as I, I got pictures, if you look at the book in San Francisco, they were built in first it was the Liberty ships and, mm -hmm. and then the sea ships in a row. And as they got ready and went, and went out to sea, they upped the knots per minute to 14 knots. Well, that was almost out of uh, submarine range to follow. And then after what the C2 and the C3 were trying to do, 16 knots. Now, on the troop transport converted, like the Monterey and the Lurleen, they could do to 23. They didn't have to go into convoys. They could go on their own. And they, they would zigzag and... And they, there's the only thing you had to watch is from the front, mm. and uh, you know they'd like to sit in front to see you coming, and and at that time they didn't have sonar, and sonar was still in the being of being made. You know the trick, catch those, so you were kind of fingers crossed and looking for. Jeez. Yeah. <clears throat> did, that, did that weigh on your mind? That uh, or were you able to block that out? That. Uh... I think we blocked it out because yeah. we were told what to do when we were trying to do it. Yeah. We got our rest. They fed us well. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what, what, were, what, was life, what were conditions like on the ship? Your, your sleeping quarters, the food? Uh, just what, talk about it, generally what life was like on the ship. Well, in our case, we had a, a folks with for four people. Where three guys would sleep in there. <coughs> and then the four to eight and the eight watch, they'd all have their rooms. 
And then we had a dining room with a kitchen group that would, you, you could sit in there and order from a menu. Wow. Just a meat or two a day, you know. <coughs> Excuse me. They fed as well. And you got your rest. And during the day, if you had some time, you did a little work, but they made sure you got your rest. And most of the time at sea, if it was a little rough, you had to sleep in your bunk and put a strap over so you could lay there and not roll out. <laughs> oh, wow. uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, first time out of San Francisco, where did you guys head to? Where was... Uh... Lay New Guinea. Oh, really? Lay New Guinea, that was uh, almost a 10,000 mile trip. <coughs> Excuse me, I'll need a glass of water after all. But Lay New Guinea at that time was Jap held. And we unloaded the first load there, went back real quick to pick another load up and bring them back. And by that time we got back, they had already pushed the Japs back. <coughs> and Brad, the worst thing I saw was when we pulled in, we couldn't drop anchor. We had a bang, and everybody had to go over. Now you're unloading troops with a with a, net. The, the the ropes hanging over the side. The net, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you got close enough, and where these 47, I forgot the name of the plane, C40, uh, P47s, they were just in, up, and they would still have their dog fights. Wow. They had to dig a long, deep ditch. The graders were in, probably. Uh, 50 yards long. Just a minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the air base was just graded in and they'd come in. You'd see the plane come in with holes in them and they would just barely be able to land. They were pretty well shot up. But the thing that really hit both of them, all of us, these trucks were coming in where they had pushed the Japs back in the dead and unloading the dead in the trench. They would dump them in the trench and then they would push dirt in on them. I'm sorry. That's fine. Yeah, don't worry about that. Wow. That was the toughest. Yeah. And I don't think that those bodies were ever retrieved or brought back because there were so many of them. I heard later that once New Guinea was pretty well taken over and the Japs driven out, it improved. And then they could, as a matter of fact, the second time the troop ship went down, we brought a load of injured back. Oh, wow. And they come back to Hawaii. And they were on the main island of Hawaii. They set up a re uh, re rehab, and my wife got to see that when we were over there. And a big marine base, and that's where they brought them back, the rehab. Mm -hmm. Now, when you guys would go, uh, like New Guinea and such, uh, and we're in port, did you ever get a chance to go ashore, or did you stay on the ship the whole time? Uh... No, we had to stay on the ship. Okay. Yeah, you know, you're talking about New Guinea now? Yeah, yeah. The second trip, they did take a couple of... The truck loads, you know what they call them, two, two big trucks. They took us in. There was a native village they had moved back. We got to see those natives. We didn't get off the truck. Yeah. They just kind of took us in and drove around and brought us back and put us back on the ship. Good. But those natives are still living down there, just living like natives. That had to be, uh, once again, I keep going back to this innocent Kansas boy. That must have been like visiting <laughs> Mars. It must have just been so, so different. It uh, was. Uh, yeah. And you know what? I understand to this day there's still natives living over there. Yeah, Even yeah. in uh, uh, Australia, we were with Australian uh -huh. troops. We would have, when we'd stop at an island and have get to get off of an island after the war front moved over, we'd have some coffee and tea and a little USO. Uh -huh. And uh, we'd drink coffee and the Australians liked their tea. Oh, right, yeah. And I can remember a lot of guys say, "Hey, girl, let's have a cup of tea, huh?" <laughs> <laughs> we would talk about that type of thing, but it, we both we survived it. Yeah, right. And the yeah. Australians, they were a tremendous help. They yeah, were, yeah. Tremendous help. And and how would uh, I don't know if the do the merchant marines still ha have the cer same ceremony as the navy when you, you cross the equator? The, oh, uh, absolutely. Talk about uh, the the oh, polywog. 
well, shellback I've, ceremony. I've got it in the right, right there in that deal there, if I uh -huh. can memorize it. Yeah. Uh, there's a deal there about going across. Oh, yeah. But they had to be careful because we still had to do our duty yeah, and our right, watch yeah. and all that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, we went across in peacetime with my wife on the cruise. That was much worse. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot worse. See, uh, you know, peacetime. But in the army, they left you know you went across the equator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, how many, how many, how many mi uh, uh, missions or uh, cross or? Uh, uh, Across the equator? Well, no. How many times did you go back and forth between? Uh, I'm trying to think of the number of times on the ship making making runs. Oh, okay. Let's let's go back to the two runs across. Here's the thing: when we went across the equator, first time during the initiation, mm -hmm. they would tell us. First of all, they'd say, "Get your mail out. You're gonna are gonna pass a mail boy, and you can let the mail off here." <laughs> well, that didn't work. <laughs> they did not say have such a thing as a mail boy. And then we'll tell you, you're gonna see another surprise. As we go across, you're gonna see water going down the grain one way, <laughs> go across, and it'll go down the other way. And you thought, that's a bunch of baloney. But that turned out to be true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> turned out to be true. Even my wife got to see that yeah. in the peace time. <laughs> but that's about it and other little tricks. But usually the officer and the officer in charge were very careful to keep every under control not to let it get out, but they couldn't afford to. Yeah, right. Because they were short of personnel. Yeah. In the army, with 5,000 troops on, they had to keep their people. And you know, Brad, the bad part, we had five holes uh, in some of the ships. But on the, on the cruise ship, they converted all the rooms to army. And they had they, a room... Half this, they'd have these bunk beds hanging there, yeah, and warm down there. When we went across the equator, they could then they'd come out on deck. And then, if you walked the deck, they would be out playing cards or shooting dice. Uh -huh. <laughs> <clears throat> but those troops went through heck, and we got to sleep in little rooms. And we had some air coming in, we'd open the porthole and put an air catcher out. And have some air coming in, but bread it was tough. Yeah, yeah. Now after your runs to New Guinea, where did you go from there then? Oh, my first trip on that was on a uh, <clears throat> supply ship. We went down to get on the sign us on the ship, and the ship was already loaded. They had trucks on the on the out in the open on the top deck. The holes were covered and sealed. But down in there, when I watched them unload, they unloaded more and more equipment, jeeps, ammunition, food, and for non-commissioned officers, drinks, beer, and their entertainment down there. But on deck, all everything chained down and cosmoline because of the seawater hitting uh -huh. it, uh -huh. and cosmoline uh -huh. kept it from r rusting. Mm -hmm. And I, does that answer your question uh, on... Uh, oh, just asking, after oh, you went to New Guinea, what, what yeah. was your next run? Oh, the Gilbert Islands. Gilbert Islands, okay. Now, that's just south, a little south by, by navigational miles, so it'll say south by southwest, mm -hmm. Gilbert Islands. And then the string starts from the st Gilbert Islands. The next stop was the Marshalls. As the Gilbert Islands were taken, we had to move, go back and get another load. By that time, we'd get back in the convoy, and we'd go to the marshals, come back. And by that time, the ship had to be going for a barnacle clearance on the bottom. They'd jack them up. We were assigned another ship. And I've got that in the books, mm -hmm. about four different ships, mm -hmm. five. And then we went to the Marshall Islands. And from the Marshall Islands, the Iwo Jima. Mm -hmm. So you're just... Guam. Guam, yeah, Guam. So you're just following the pipe. Up the, yes, yeah. on the pipe. But the Marines were ahead of us. The army was ahead of us, and we were supplying. We couldn't get the supplies up there fast enough. And they were mutching ships up the yin yang, wow. as many as they could get. And then it was Squam, Iwo Jima, and then Iliwita was the last place. No, Okinawa. Okinawa. Yeah. And Iliwita then. Isn't that yeah. Okinawa, yeah, right. Yeah. Excuse yeah. me. 
That's why I have her helmet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my memory, my... But Okinawa... Now, when you would go back and forth, what was your home base? Uh, Hawaii, or did you go back to the uh, to the States? Yeah, lots of times, Hawaii had everything we needed. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, but sometimes some of the ships had to go to the States. Okay. Because Hawaii didn't have enough to do all the ships. Yeah. Because the Navy come in, too, for supplies. And the Merchant Marine took uh, supply. We brought the injured back, and if they didn't have all the merchandise to go back... And a lot of times it was just medication and, and other stuff that they needed real bad. It depends on the cargo. But our cargo was usually heavy equipment that I got on. So it was usually a run to either San Francisco, L.A., or both, and even including Seattle, depending on what you loaded on. And time you left, Brad, we were open sea to the Hawaii. You could go on your own. They had the subs under control by mm -hmm, then. Mm -hmm. And we would, you know what a water line is on a ship? No, please uh, tell everybody, uh, explain what that is. The water line on a ship, and I know Thomas is familiar with it, and so is Carla. The water line, when you load a ship, that water line should be, uh, you pay attention to the load. And, that's what, and that water line, once you're there, you're loaded. You should stop right there. And the number of times we'd be below that water line. It's just a little more. You need that. And the pencil that officer on the ship, he'd probably would say, stop. That's it. But they would like to do as much as they could. But I've never heard of no mishap even below the water line. The only thing that happened, Brett, before that time, back up a little bit, when the Liberty ships first started, they would break, break in, in half. half. I was going to ask you that, yeah. Yeah. They had a problem. Yeah, with the weld. Too, with the welds. Yeah. They too big a load. And I was on a Liberty ship, but we weren't overloaded to begin with. So we made it fine, but some of them didn't. Yeah. And they got rid of them as quick as they could because in that book you can see where they were building the, the victories and building, starting to build a heavier and, and better quality. But the Liberty ships... There's still one in San Francisco you can visit. Jer this is Jeremiah. It's in San Francisco. Anybody ever out there, you can open to the public to the museum. In Pedro, we have a museum too, but it's a victory ship, the SS Victory Lane. And then there's one back in New Jersey, a merchant marine ship of another liberty. But, yeah, they finally went out. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm, so, I'm, I'm glad you were familiar with that. Yeah. Now, but, as, as we get further up the, the pipe, uh, w one issue that becomes more and more of an issue for you guys is the kamikazes. Talk uh, what that was like. Well, I'll just give you the picture. Uh, once we got into Okinawa, it was the worst. Yeah. And General MacArthur, I think he knew that he was sitting there waiting because he was going to invade Japan and hit to Russia. Well, at that time, we were right in the middle with cargo, and we just told us, hey, sit still. And when you were on up on the ship and looked around, just ships. That Almost, must have been an incredible sight. It was. There was American ships, Amer uh, uh, Australian ships, and they were sitting out there just waiting, and comic, they knew that. Yeah. They would come out dogfight, and they knew that Nimmons already had, back in Guam, gave orders, no cross sheeting across, because we were heading <coughs> on ships. So the kamikaze would usually come in, in the back, low, to avoid that shooting. But after that command went in and come in low, they used to come in. You could see them dogfighting up there, and some planes coming down. And then they could pick a ship, any, any uh, kamikaze. And you know what? I understand, Brad, that they were given just enough training to fly a train, and they were under drugs or alcohol or drugs, and that's their intent. Pick out a ship, the biggest one you get, and hit home run. Yeah. Blow them up. Yeah. And a lot of times that happened near us. Not, shrapnel was a bad thing. It was flying all over the place from ship to ship. And usually when they hit a ship, it went down. It, it never really survived. It would burn or go down. Oh, boy. 
and you just had to put up with it. Wow. Yeah. And hope you got out of there. Yeah. But we were sitting ducks. Yeah, right. Absolutely sitting ducks. Yeah. And and again, Neiman's didn't want the Navy to shoot back up in the air to hit our own planes. So there you were. Well, I was always, yeah, I was, you'd see those uh, shooting up there and it's like all this lead's up flat, in the air. Flat. It's got to come back down. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It, uh, whew. Wow. Yeah. The kamikaze pilots had funerals before they left. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah they did. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they did. Yeah. And in the meantime, when there was a little break in here, Tokyo Rose. Yeah, talk about Tokyo Rose. They had the radio on and and for the news and yeah. sometimes for the PA. And then sometimes, listen to this, now hear this. Tokyo Rose talking. Yeah. She said, boys, go home. You're going to get killed. You'll never make it back. So I'm going to turn it off up there. <laughs> <laughs> But Tokyo Rose was on there. She was really trying to flirt with the guys and soften their hearts. Maybe Carla could in, enlighten her virtual. But uh, yeah, they were. She was a menace. Yeah, right. Right. She was a menace. You know about her. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that that leads to the next question. Then, uh, as far as communications, I mean, in today's world, we've got computers, we've got cell phones. I mean, we can instantly communicate. <laughs> Being isolated on the ship, one, how did you get news about the from the outside world, or did you? And two, uh, what about communicate? Talk about communications back and forth to home, uh, and what that was like. Oh, wait a minute! First thing, back and forth to ships, flags, and the lamp. You know the lamp. Mm -hmm. Okay. Otherwise, no communications because the radio man, uh, he would bring the news. There were always two radio men on our ships, maybe sometimes three. And they would keep you up on what's going on. But as far as hearing from home or getting a contact, the only way I could answer that, it might work if you went to the officer of the day, but you didn't know what was going on at home. Yeah. But if someone got sick on the ship, which we did have a couple of times, and it was reported and the radio men would contact Hawaii, and they'd get the answer back, and they'd say, get them on the nearest island, and we'll have air transportation for the injured back to Hawaii. That kind of communications we had through the radio then, but not toward home or anything like that, uh, personal. Well, you know, really the only communications you had was, was mail. Did mail yeah. keep up? Because you guys were all over the place. Yeah. Did it keep yeah. up? Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Mail was forgotten. It was just... Wow. And the, <laughs> and the mail boys were a joke. <laughs> Yeah. But in the convoy, like in uh, the Gilberts, the Marshall Islands, a little time we had there, you had to wait to unload, you know, and the Navy, Navy had a ship that would bring mail out. And you were lucky to get mail, but some always did get mail. They would not only supply you with the mail that come to the island, they would also bring food, because you, we were on powdered eggs and powdered milk for some times. Once again, that had to be tough for a Kansas farm boy that was used to fresh eggs and Absolutely. fresh milk. Absolutely. Yeah. We were looking for that Navy ship or supply coming around, <laughs> yeah. and it gets so much because they yeah. had to take so much to the other ship, yeah. too. Wow. Yeah, but that's a very little mail. Until we got back to Hawaii, we left off injured, and there would be a mail hold up there. That could be months old, I would imagine. It could be months old, yeah. Yeah, jeez. Yeah. Your poor folks. Uh, Oh, yeah. Particularly your mom back home, wondering, you know, oh, yeah. how's he doing? What, what, where is he at? What's, uh, what's going on? Well, you right. know, my mom, when I got home, she had a big Bible. That thing was almost wore out. Oh, wow. <laughs> and <laughs> it just, and prayers. <laughs> it was almost wore out. Wow. And she kept praying. There were four of us in the service. About, at the same time? You no, know, two of them come back. Yeah. They were in from 41 on after Pearl Harbor. And they come home and they had kind of, Shell shock, one was shell yeah. shock. But they were able to take over the farm family with proper medication. And then Greg, my younger brother, and I kind of got, he went in 46, and I went in 43. Boy, yeah. Another thing uh, I, I come across quite a bit, uh, you ever caught up in any typhoons? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, talk about those. 
Well, the best way I can talk about the worst typhoon we had, we were definitely in one. And, the, and the, it was a smaller convoy. It was about south of the equator and toward, uh, uh, kind of toward between Gilbert Islands and uh, Marshall Islands. And we, uh, the skipper knew it was coming. So the orders were, they took the wind readings. And as the wind hit, orders were coming over to turn your convoy so the ship would do this rather than roll. But at that time, before you got in and the ship would roll, my hour on the wheel time, I'd be on the wheel time and I could walk up the bulkhead. Oh, jeez. And come down and hang on. That would roll way over and you'd think, this damn thing's gonna keep going when it's time. <laughs> but it would always come back. And then up. And then down, I could see the bow going down into the water and come up and spill the water. And you'd look for other ships out there. Well, the orders were spread, spread out. And by that time, one safety thing, the subs couldn't maneuver in that. So the safety factor was the storm, and you could spread the convoy and keep going and just survive and get, get it by. It was so terrifying. Though. Yeah, it was terrifying. Yeah. <clears throat> And eat, we'd go to the dining hall, they, the tables, they had a ring about this far around so that the stuff wouldn't roll off. You had to eat the best you could. Jeez, wow. But I pitied the guys that had done the cooking, you know, they had to put up with that uh, in, the, in the kitchens. I don't, a lot of times we didn't get, just got solid food. Yeah, wow. Not yeah. cooked food. Well, moving ahead now, uh, uh, Okinawa's, uh, 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 the battle, that battle's over. Now you guys prepare for the invasion of Japan and and then followed by the, the dropping of the bombs that, uh, that ended the war. Talk about that time period and what that was like. Okay, right after we were sitting there, uh, Mac uh, Truman pulled MacArthur out. I think you remember that. No, that's the Korean War. The Korean War. Yeah. Oh, the, oh, yeah, yeah. The commander. Yeah, the commander. Spruits. Yeah, he was cautioned. Not anyway. The the invasion was on hold. Yeah. And then when the bomb was dropped and and it was a uh, a verbal surrender, it wasn't signed yet. Uh, it was officially we thought, and it was. It was the end of any attacks or making a landing. So we. Got through the night, it was peaceful, and we had more at ease. Everybody was more at ease. But in the morning of the next day, you heard some ships pulling their horn. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And the orders come over from the skipper room. Uh, Sunday, and this was on a midweek, we're going to have a nice dinner for everybody. Oh, you know, they wow. made special food. And that was supposed to go around the ships, you know, for a little celebration. But that was the day after. And then we had to sit there for about a week for further orders. Mm. Not a little less than a week. And, <laughs> and the orders finally come in, what to do. Where were you sitting again? Pardon? Where were you sitting? When you were we yeah. were right in the middle again in a, in a convoy, right you in the convoy. Now, Okinawa. Okinawa. Yeah, you were, you yeah were, Okinawa. Yeah. That was the last point. It would have been a... In the Japan, then could could you comprehend? They talked. They talked about these two great big bombs dropped. Could you understand what they were? What they meant? I mean, it. Well, Hiroshima, Kawasaki. Yeah. The first time we didn't know what the hell that was. Yeah. We heard it was a terrible, but. And then finally, word come around. It was total destruction. And then finally, the second one hit. And we heard that was a total destruction. That come over. You know, the skipper was up to all that. And then we just sat there. <clears throat> what do you do? What's next? Until unconditional surrender was announced. And, and what did that feel like for you? It's like, okay, the war's over. I made it. Uh, it must have been a, a huge relief. Oh, I'll take a drink of water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> was, oh. Yes. Brad, yes, it was. Well, we were all happy. We were shaking hands. We were, for the first time, showing some life. Yeah. 
There's a certain amount of scare. We were all scared about what's going to be next. And Brad, we felt like prayers were answered. And they were. Yeah. You know, Brad, we heard later, if that attack would have come about, yeah. you wouldn't see me sitting That's there. That's right. Wouldn't see anybody sitting no. here. Most everybody's sitting here. Yeah. They were they were armed to the child out yeah. to chip. Yeah. And they were gonna fight to death. That's right. <clears throat> they were gonna fight to death. That'd have been terrible. Yeah. So I really don't know how the military or Nemans would have handled that. Yeah. Brett, I'd say you know all about that. And yeah, I'm glad I didn't get to that point. Right, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It would have been a it would have been bad. A lot of blood. So the war is now officially over, and you said you, you kind of sat, sat there for a week yeah. waiting for instructions. Where'd you go from there? Where'd the... Yeah. Well, the orders come down, and the ships had to be lined up to go back. But in the meantime, there were orders coming that make room on your ship because we're going to send some material with you. And some got wounded people. I mean, now we didn't have to travel in Congo. Yeah, yeah. So the faster ships could get back to Hawaii, and they took more wounded, and the Navy and the, anybody that could, because there were a lot, there were some that needed help. Yeah, wow. And we were told just for further order to get anything we can help, and they finally, within weeks, had enough room on some merchant ships to haul at least from 1,200 to 1,500 troops to help bring some of them back to Hawaii. So that's primarily what you did, you, you, yeah. you, you brought soldiers home? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And the Navy was a hell, a hell of a time keeping the ship supplied with enough food and water. And you know, when you take on extra people, you have a, so the, the, the main cook, I, he had a name, I can't think of his name, but he had to do all the ordering and get whatever he could to feed these guys and back to Hawaii and make runs on other returns. And again, just go, go, go. Wow. But it was peacetime, yeah, right? Yeah. It was a good time. Yeah. yeah. We, you need to talk about the discharges that were given to you on the 15th. Oh, yeah. During that time, I was under, and, and the contract uh, to discharge is in the big, it's the Army. All the Army personnel were giving dates that they would be discharged, I mean. And the Coast Guard, since they had the maritime version, they gave us early <coughs> discharges, honorable discharges. And mine fell on, uh, I f forget it the date. It dated the 15th of September. Yes, 15th of September. Uh, uh, 45? 45. And then that's just the paperwork. And then it become the Merchant Marine. The Maritime was under the Coast Guard, so the, the Maritime training sort of come to an end. Catalina Island phased out, but the academies kept going. And they got bigger, by the way. They got one back east. I think they got one in Florida, if I'm, I believe there's one down there. But they're going all right. But the training and all the basic training and all was converted back to private property again. Because we had taken over a lot of property there and that in other places. It had to go back to civilian control. Yeah, yeah. And even in Hawaii. So you mustered out on September 15th then, or? Uh, 45. 45, yeah. 45. No, you didn't 46. muster out. You elected to stay. I elected, yeah. I st you, I, you were discharged from the, from the... Yeah, I got his answer right here, just a minute. <laughs> If I can find it. Oh. Okay. The primary duty of the Merchant Marine Service also changed overnight. Cargo ships had to be in, transformed into passenger ships to bring home the men of the armed forces. This became the number one priority for the remainder months of 1945. Surplus cargo was also returned to America to be used in other parts of the war.
torn world. A second change of status took place when the United States Coast Guard issued honorable discharges. They were written up in Oregon. To all the mer maritime merchant marine veterans of August, on August 15, 1945, and honorable discharges for the armed forces of the United States of America on the same day. Now, at this point, we were free to go home if we wanted to. But with the veteran troops, I elected to stay on two more years. The war was in turmoil and in need of recovery. We worked under the flag, United States Relief, Rehabil Rehabilitation Administration.